her arms aren't swaying and she's carrying something. It's not uncommon for a film to reveal its main theme in the opening scene of its story. It has to grab the audience's attention and give them a taste of what's to come. Not unlike the very essay that I'm reading to you right now, or really any other medium that tries to effectively convey a message. American Sniper, as you can see here, is no exception to this. Navy SEAL Chris Kyle is laying on a rooftop in war-torn Fallujah, his rifle aimed at a mother and her son. A way for Clint Eastwood to point us to his film's main theme, family, or rather the tragic destruction of family through war. However, it seems that this message didn't really catch on to a number of high-profile audiences. Most notable are tweets from the likes of Seth Rogen, who compared the film to the faux Nazi propaganda movie shown in the third act of Inglorious Bastards. Then there's Michael Moore stating that all snipers are cowards, Noam Chomsky weighing in on what he states is a testament of support of everything that's wrong with American foreign policy, documentary director Robert Greenwald doing roughly the same thing on MSNBC, and finally former presidential candidate Howard Dean speaking his mind on real time with Bill Maher. I bet you if you looked at uh, a cross-section of the Tea Party and people who go to see this movie, there's a lot of intersection. I could go on for a while, but I think you get the point. A lot of high-profile partisan liberal viewers did not enjoy what they interpreted to be a blatantly pro-war propaganda movie. A movie made by a man whose personal politics already seem to run counter to those who stand against the film. When somebody does not do the job, we've got to let them go. A man who would have therefore naturally and consciously made a movie that shows audiences a simplistic and glorified version of the war. Which is odd to say the least, as that would be completely out of character for Clint Eastwood, a director who has a record of making nuanced and often open-minded films, be glamorizing the gratuitous killing in western movies, addressing gender and class issues for women in sports, humanizing Japanese soldiers during the Second World War, tackling the corrupt criminal justice system of the early 20th century, and being criticized by some conservatives for dramatizing the homosexual private life of FBI director Edgar Hoover. Now to accurately point out the true message of American Sniper, we can make use of literary theorist Kenneth Burke's cluster analysis method, which attempts to seek out the film's most important recurring terms, with a positive god term on the one hand and a counteracting devil term on the other. In between float subordinate terms that align with either of the main terms, but that can change their value as the story progresses. But before we get into any of that, let's start by taking a closer look at our god term. In order to truly understand the character of Chris Kyle and why he does what he does, we first need to examine how his value system works. Traveling back to his youth, we can observe how his strict upbringing in a highly conservative household laid the foundations for the man he would later become. From his father's stoic sheepdog philosophy of protecting the defenseless from all that's evil in the world, to sermons about God's plan for his believers, a yet unknown path to glory, and lastly a lesson in perseverance. Get back here! You don't ever leave your rifle in the dirt. Yes, sir. All these teachings work for the concept of family, to protect it from danger, to believe in God's plan for its glory, and to never abandon one's duty towards it. It's this value system that Cal carries with him into adulthood and that, after perhaps having laid dormant for some time, is reawakened by the terrorist attacks on the American embassies. Kyle's words and emotional reaction indicating that his notion of family has extended into the nation as family. An attack on the nation is indirectly an attack on his own family, which pushes him into joining the Navy SEALs who, like many other military units, actively try to form a tight-knit group of non-quitters. Say for the faint of heart, most men they wash out, they quit. I'm not most men, sir. I don't quit. So Chris, despite his apparent old age, stays faithful to his beliefs and doesn't quit on this other newly perceived family. Another instance where Chris's values influence events is when he manages to grab the interest of his future wife, Taya, after he denounces a fellow SEAL for cheating and quitting on his marriage. Chris and Taya's shared love for family makes their subsequent relationship grow and things seem to be shaping up to Kyle's divine plan for a while, until one fateful September morning. War is the devil term that slowly starts to take control over Kyle's family values. The first value that's put to the test is his sheepdog notion of protecting family, which as we've seen consists of three layers. His family at home, his military family, and his country. 
As Chris is deployed to Iraq, we see him excelling in his role on the battlefield as an Overwatch sniper, keeping the evils of war from his military family as well as keeping it as far away as possible from his own direct family. the call home is supposed to go, babe. However, he slowly finds out that it's impossible to do either of these things. Because regardless of his expertise as a sniper, he's proven to be unable to protect every single marine under his watch, and he also has to live with the fact that in order to protect his family, he's forced to destroy another. And even though he does manage to protect countless of troops from physical harm, he can't shield them from the mental harm the war inevitably causes them, as is exemplified when Chris runs into his little brother who's about to return home from the war. I'm just tired, man. I'm going home. Kyle's building frustration over his inability to protect everyone climaxes when he witnesses the deaths of an Iraqi family he vouched to protect after having extracted vital information from them, and thereby consciously having involved them into the war. His first deployment ends thus with the notion that war and protecting through war inevitably makes collateral damage of family, which we can see even more clearly as Kyle returns home. With his feelings of frustration and guilt gone unresolved, it quickly becomes clear that far from having left the war behind, Chris has brought it home in the form of mental trauma. His developing PTSD causes him to become increasingly disconnected from his family life. Having become absent-minded, he constantly slips back to the evils of the war and the death of the Iraqi family. Perhaps the perfect metaphor for Chris's inability to keep war and family separate is when he's watching American troops getting shot by his rival sniper while sitting next to a Christmas tree, the epitome of everything family, God and peace. Still unwilling to talk about the war, Chris is thus unwittingly destroying his own family as Taya tries to tell him that Chris, just talk about it. You're not protecting me by not talking about it. But in Kyle's mind, protecting through war is the only way of protecting both his direct family as well as his other families. It's not about them. It's about us. For Chris, quitting the war would mean quitting on the Navy SEALs and therefore his family in Iraq, which is not something his value system allows him to do and it's why we see him returning again and again and again. This no-quitting mentality is supported by his confidence in finding glory in God's divine plan, as he carries with him his old Bible wherever he goes and he continuously assures Taya that You got nothing to be afraid of. What are you? It's all part of the plan. For Chris, his path to glory is in his self-perceived crusade against the forces of evil in Iraq, which seems to be why he's sporting a crusader cross tattoo and why he believes in the righteousness of the US presence there. Well, there's evil here, we've seen it. God's plan and glory therefore become associated with war rather than family. However, Kyle's never-ending crusade becomes increasingly reckless and vengeful over time, as he sets out on a personal mission to find and kill the people responsible for killing his fellow soldiers and the Iraqi family. This transformation can be seen in the SEALs adopting the Punisher logo, a Marvel anti-hero who will do anything to get revenge against the people who killed his family. But it's also noticeable in Kyle's behavior at home, where he's now completely disconnected from his family, leading to Taya giving him an ultimatum. If you leave again, I don't think we'll be here when you get back. Not only does Kyle's plan and obsession almost destroy what he holds most dear, it also comes at the cost of two of his friends. One of them, his best friend Mark Lee, a would-be preacher turned soldier, was slowly becoming disillusioned by the war and Kyle's dogmatic interpretation of God's plan for glory. This is shown through the strongly worded anti-war letter he leaves behind. My question is when does glory fade away and become a wrongful crusade or an unjustified means by which consumes one completely? I it's a message of de-glorification that only really hits Kyle when he's finally got the chance to take out Mustafa, the Syrian sniper that started his crusade. Against orders to stand down, Chris chooses to pull the trigger instead, to protect his fellow soldiers, to show his no-quitter mentality, and most of all, to finally find catharsis in his crusade or his plan for glory. As Mustafa falls, however, there's no great celebration, no real catharsis for Chris as his friend speaks the words. Mission accomplished. Perhaps referring to George W. Bush's infamous speech after the initial invasion of Iraq had ended. Of course, the war was far from over at that point. There was no real nuanced, thought out plan for post war Iraq, giving but a false sense of catharsis. Something similar happens after Kyle takes that shot. Their position now exposed, Kyle's team is quickly surrounded by insurgents as they face certain death. 
He realizes that his crusade will ultimately be the end of him and his family as he finally decides it's time to go home. I'm ready. I'm ready to come home. By sheer luck, the team manages to escape the insurgents through a sandstorm, a perfect metaphor for the fog of war, perhaps signifying Chris struggling with his internal moral consciousness, his struggle between family and war. And it's here where he visually quits on both the war and the dogmatism of his father's upbringing by leaving his rifle in the dirt. However, even after having realigned with his family and taking up a healthier sheepdog role by helping disabled and traumatized veterans deal with their experiences, Chris too would ultimately become a victim of the war. So I would argue that far from being a pro-war, pro-neoconservative propaganda movie, American Sniper can much more accurately be described as an anti-war movie, depicting its destructive nature towards family. Whether it be the Kyle family, the Navy SEAL Brotherhood, or even the family of rival sniper Mustafa, war always invades the home and corrupts and destroys it from within. Director Clint Eastwood made a film condemning the war, not the warrior, and criticizing the neoconservative politics that resorted to it. American Sniper is not a direct adaptation of Chris Kyle's life, and it isn't meant to be. Eastwood seems to have roughly adapted his story to make a broader statement, to make a film that respects and puts emphasis on its veterans, one that helps us understand their experience and one that asks us not to forget their struggle. In the words of Bradley Cooper, For me and for Clint, this movie was always a character study about what the plight is for a soldier. If it's not this movie, I hope to God another movie will come out where it will shed light on the fact of what service men and women have to go through, and that we need to pay attention to our vets. It doesn't go any further than that, it's not a political discussion about war even, it's a discussion about the reality. And the reality is that people are coming home, and we have to take care of them. Alright, thank you all so much for watching. Seeing how much hate American Sniper received, I just had to express my views of the movie, so um, I hope this, this video cleared things up a little bit. Uh, I want to thank Daniel K. Merwin for his thesis on partisan reception of American Sniper, which was a big influence for this video. Uh, delves extensively into how and why political audiences came to such a widely different interpretation of the film. Lastly, if you want to help us out and sustain this channel, hop on over to Patreon or PayPal uh, where you can leave us a dollar. Anyways, thank you all again for watching, happy 4th of July to our American viewers, and I hope to see you all in the next one.